Well, here we are, the final deep dive. Can you believe it? It's flown by, hasn't it? It really has. And we've saved a big one for last. We're going all in on ecology for this one. Yeah, this is where it all comes together, isn't it? It is. It's kind of the ultimate goal of GCSE biology, to see how everything in the living world is connected. Exactly. All the amazing interactions between organisms and their environment. It's fascinating stuff. Absolutely. So for anyone who maybe missed the last six deep dives, what's the deal with ecology? Ecology is like the study of life's big picture. It's all about understanding how living things rely on each other and their surroundings to survive. Right. So we're not just talking about individual animals or plants here. No, it's much bigger than that. We're talking about whole communities, entire ecosystems. Okay. So let's break that down a bit. What are the key terms we need to be familiar with when we're talking about ecology? Well, you always start with an individual organism, right? Like a single oak tree or a solitary hedgehog. Okay. That makes sense. But there are loads of oak trees and hedgehogs out there. Right, and that's where the idea of a species comes in. A species is a group of similar organisms that can reproduce with each other. So all the oak trees that can interbreed make up the oak tree species. Got it. And if we were looking at all the oak trees in, say, a particular forest, what would you call that? That would be the population of oak trees in that forest. It's all the individuals of the same species living in a particular area. So we've got individual species population. What's the next level up? Well, think about that forest again. It's not just oak trees there, is it? No, there'd be bluebells and foxes and all sorts of other living things. Exactly. And all those different populations interacting together in that forest make up the community. So the community is all the different species living in a particular area. Exactly. And if you take that community and factor in all the non-living things, like the soil, the sunlight, the rainfall, and how they all affect each other, you've got an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is like the whole package, the living and non-living parts yeah. all intertwined. That's and I remember learning that the non-living bits are called abiotic factors, and the living bits are biotic factors. You've got it. And one of the most important concepts in ecology is how all these factors are connected through interdependence. Interdependence. Yeah, it means that organisms depend on each other and their surroundings for survival. They can't exist in isolation. Can you give me an example of that? Sure. Think about a bee visiting a flower. The bee gets nectar for food and the flower gets pollinated, which helps it reproduce. So they both benefit from that interaction. Exactly. Or think about birds nesting in trees. The birds get shelter and a safe place to raise their young, and the trees benefit because the birds might help control pests. Okay, so it's like a delicate balance, everything relying on everything else. It is, and that's why changes to an ecosystem can have a huge knock-on effect. If you remove one species, it can disrupt the whole system. Like a domino effect. Kind of, yeah. Like if a disease wipes out a particular type of plant, the insects that feed on that plant will also suffer. And then the animals that eat those insects might decline as well. Precisely. It can have far-reaching consequences. So what makes an ecosystem stable then? A stable ecosystem is one where the populations of different species remain relatively constant over time. So no massive fluctuations in numbers. No, things are pretty much in equilibrium. The biotic and abiotic factors are balanced. And some examples of stable ecosystems would be things like tropical rainforests, oak woodlands, coral reefs, those kinds of places. Yes, those are great examples. They tend to have high levels of biodiversity, which helps make them more resilient to change. So let's dig a bit deeper into those abiotic factors, the non-living things. How do things like light and temperature affect the organisms in an ecosystem? Well, they're incredibly important, really. Light intensity, for example, dictates how much energy plants can capture for photosynthesis. So if there's less light, plants won't grow as well. Exactly. And that can have a knock-on effect on the entire food chain. Less plant growth means less food for herbivores, which means less food for carnivores. And temperature, that must play a big role as well. Oh, absolutely. Temperature affects the rate of pretty much all biological processes. So if it's too cold, things slow down? Yeah. Like in the winter, many animals hibernate or migrate to warmer areas because they can't function properly in the cold. And too much heat can be a problem too, right? Definitely. Organisms have a range of temperatures they can tolerate. If it gets too hot, they can overheat and die. What about water? That seems pretty essential for all living things. It is. Water is vital for survival. Too little water and you have drought conditions, which can be devastating. Mm. Too much water can also be a problem. Like if there's flooding. Exactly. Plants can drown if their roots are submerged for too long. 
And I remember seeing something about soil pH and mineral content being important too. Oh yeah, those are crucial. The pH of the soil affects how easily plants can absorb nutrients. The different plants prefer different soil pHs. Exactly. Some like acidic soils, others prefer alkaline conditions. And the mineral content of the soil dictates what nutrients are available for plants to grow. Okay, and what about wind? How does that factor into things? Wind can affect the rate of transpiration, which is how plants lose water through their leaves. So windy conditions can make plants dry out more quickly. Yes, especially on hot days. Wind can also affect the distribution of seeds and pollen, which can influence plant diversity. And finally, the gases in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is essential for photosynthesis. It is. Plants need carbon dioxide to make their food. And oxygen, of course, is vital for respiration for most living things. Okay, so those are the abiotic factors. Now let's look at the biotic factors, how living things interact with each other. What are some of the key interactions we see in ecosystems? Well, one of the most obvious is predation, where one organism, the predator, hunts and kills another organism, the prey. Like lions hunting zebras. Exactly. That's a classic example. And this predator-prey relationship can have a big influence on the populations of both species. And what about competition? Competition happens when organisms are vying for the same limited resources, whether it's food, water, space, or even mates. So organisms that are better at competing are more likely to survive and reproduce. That's right. And that drives natural selection, the process by which organisms with advantageous traits are more likely to pass on those traits to their offspring. And we also have things like symbiosis, where <laughs> different species have close relationships that can benefit one or both parties. Yes. Like the relationship between bees and flowers we talked about earlier, that's a type of symbiosis called mutualism, where both organisms benefit. And there's parasitism as well, right? Where one organism benefits at the expense of another. Yes. Like a tapeworm living in the gut of an animal, that's a parasitic relationship. So all these interactions help shape the structure of a community. Now. Organisms have all sorts of clever ways to survive in different environments, don't they? We're talking about adaptations. Yes, adaptations are features that increase an organism's chances of survival and reproduction in its particular habitat. And we can categorize adaptations as structural, behavioral, or functional, right? That's right. Structural adaptations are physical features, like the thick fur of a polar bear or the camouflage of a chameleon. Behavioral adaptations are things organisms do like migrating or hibernating. Exactly. And functional adaptations are internal processes, like the way a camel's kidneys can serve water, or the way a plant produces toxins to deter herbivores. And some organisms have adaptations that allow them to live in really extreme environments, don't they? What are they called? Extremophiles? Yes. Extremophiles are amazing. They can survive in places like hot springs, deep sea vents, or even the Arctic tundra. They must have some pretty unique adaptations to cope with those conditions. They do. They have specialized enzymes and cell structures that allow them to function in those extreme environments. So let's shift gears a bit and talk about how energy flows through ecosystems. Yeah. This is where food chains come in, right? Yes. A food chain shows the linear transfer of energy from one organism to another. It always starts with a producer, like a plant or algae, which captures energy from the sun. Right. And then we have the primary consumers, the herbivores that eat the producers. And then the secondary consumers, the carnivores that eat the herbivores. And sometimes even tertiary consumers, which are carnivores that eat other carnivores. So it's a sequence of who eats whom. And how do ecologists actually study food chains in the field? Well, they can use things like transects and quadrats to sample the different organisms present in an area. A transect is like a line across a habitat where you record the species you find. Exactly. And a quadrat is a squared frame you use to count the number of organisms in a specific area. And they can use those techniques to look at the distribution and abundance of different species. That's right. And that can help them understand how the ecosystem is structured. Now, we also touched on the idea of population cycles between predators and prey. How does that work? Well, in a stable ecosystem, the populations of predators and prey tend to fluctuate in a predictable way. So if the prey population increases, the predator population will increase as well. Exactly, because there's more food available for the predators. But as the predator population grows, they start to eat more prey, which causes the prey population to decline. And then with less prey available, the predator population declines as well allowing the prey population to recover. That's right. It's a natural cycle that helps regulate the populations of both species. Okay, let's move on to something really important. How materials like carbon and water cycle through ecosystems. 
Let's start with the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle is all about how carbon moves between the atmosphere, living organisms, and the Earth. So plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for photosynthesis. Yes, and they use that carbon to build their bodies. And when animals eat plants, they get that carbon as well. And how does the carbon get back into the atmosphere? Through respiration, when organisms break down food for energy, they release carbon dioxide as a waste product. And when organisms die and decompose, carbon is also released. That's right. And human activities like burning fossil fuels also release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So it's a continuous cycle of carbon being taken up and released. What about the water cycle? The water cycle is how water circulates between the oceans, the atmosphere, and the land. So water evaporates from the oceans and other water bodies, forming clouds. Yes, and then those clouds release water back to the land as precipitation, like rain or snow. And that water eventually flows back to the oceans, completing the cycle. Exactly. And throughout this cycle, water is essential for all forms of life. And decomposition plays a role in both the carbon and water cycles, doesn't it? Absolutely. Decomposers break down dead organisms and waste products, releasing nutrients back into the soil and atmosphere. And the rate of decomposition is affected by things like temperature, moisture, and oxygen availability, right? That's right. Warmer temperatures and moist conditions generally speed up decomposition. And this is why compost heaps work so well. Exactly. By creating the right conditions, you're encouraging decomposition and creating nutrient-rich compost for your garden. And I learned that anaerobic decomposition, which happens without oxygen, can produce methane gas. Yes, that's right. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas, so it's important to manage anaerobic decomposition carefully. Now let's talk about how environmental changes can affect where different species are found. Environmental changes can have a huge impact on the distribution of species. If conditions change, organisms may need to move to new areas where they can survive. So things like climate change, pollution, and habitat loss can force species to relocate or even face extinction. Exactly. And these changes can be natural or human-caused, and they're a major threat to biodiversity. Speaking of biodiversity, why is it so important to protect it? Biodiversity is essential for a healthy planet. It provides us with food, medicine, clean air and water, and so much more. It's like a safety net for ecosystems, right? The more diverse an ecosystem is, the more resilient it is to change. That's right. And diverse ecosystems are also just more interesting and beautiful places to live. Sadly, human activities are having a negative impact on biodiversity. We're losing species at an alarming rate. It's true. Habitat destruction, pollution, overfishing, and climate change are all major threats. And we talked about some specific examples like deforestation and peat bog destruction. Yes. Those are prime examples of how human activities are impacting biodiversity. Deforestation releases huge amounts of carbon dioxide, and peat bogs store vast amounts of carbon, so destroying them is really bad news for the climate. And global warming is already causing changes in species distribution melting ice caps, rising sea levels. It's a very serious issue, but there are things we can do to address these challenges. Like what? Well, we can protect existing habitats, restore degraded ecosystems, reduce our carbon footprint, and support sustainable practices. And there are also efforts to conserve endangered species and develop more sustainable ways to produce food. Exactly, like farming practices that minimize environmental impact and fishing quotas that prevent overfishing. And biotechnology is playing a role, too, with things like genetically modified crops and mycoprotein production. Yes, those are promising areas that could help us feed a growing population while reducing our impact on the planet. Well, as we wrap up this final deep dive, it's clear that ecology is a complex and fascinating field. And it's also incredibly important. It really is. Understanding how living things interact with each other and their environment is crucial for addressing the environmental challenges we face. We've covered a lot of ground in this series, from the basics of cells and genetics to the complexities of ecosystems and evolution. And hopefully it's given you a greater appreciation for the wonders of the natural world and the importance of protecting it. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive into ecology and for sticking with us throughout this entire GCSE biology series. We've enjoyed exploring these topics with you, and we hope you've learned something along the way. Keep asking questions, stay curious, and remember that even small actions can make a difference. Until next time. Bye for now.